As a starting quarterback, every interception, the stench of every loss, sticks to a player like shoulder pass after a rain game that went to overtime. But what if I told you that was a way to reset the clock, to wipe your character and restore him to a pre-draft state? Bro, all you need to do in order to pull that off is play the easiest and hardest position in football. All right, I think I'm gonna call this one backup quarterbacks. One injury away from greatness. As a guy who was on the bench for so long, did you ever think, man, I am never gonna get my shot? When did you learn you were starting, Tyler? Shoot, this morning when I was walking to the bus, LJ texted me, he said, go do your thing, man. And I said, all right, I got you, family. When I had my meeting with uh, JG in Arizona, he looked at me in the face and he said, you're not getting traded. Woke up Tuesday morning, hey, you could be traded today. Backup quarterback is an interesting position. Clipboard holders, glorified assistant coaches. When he enters the game for your team, bro, things are going great or something went terribly wrong. Either you went in by a lot and your starter's chilling on the bench or you getting cooked so bad that coach throws in the towel. Or the most common situation, right? Your starter gets hurt and all hopes for the season follow him into the tunnel, which now looks like a dark cave of despair where Super Bowl seasons go to die. But then, this dude you haven't seen since preseason comes out onto the field and completes a couple passes. You say, hmm, I don't know. This dude might be okay. Then he wins a couple of games and half your damn fan base immediately turns on the starter. It's crazy. Sound familiar? It should, because it happens all the time. Cooper Rush is better than Dak. Anybody remember that one? How about this one? We should sign Hundley and let Lamar walk. Your takeaway on what you've seen from Cooper Rush. I, I love what he's doing. It, it really reminds me of myself. Again, going back to 1991, when Troy Aitman got hurt, uh, I came in and I hadn't played in about a year and a half after my time with Al Davis and the Raiders, but I got a chance to play and went five games in a row without losing, including a playoff game in Chicago. There were guys like Skip Bay out there that were <laughs> trying to create a quarterback controversy in Dallas at that time. Same exact situation as what is going on right now. Now listen, over the past couple years, bro, Snoop and Cooper Rush have been two of my favorite backup quarterbacks. But the majority of backups traditionally at least are, let me zoom in for this, backups for a reason. And after a few consecutive starts of solid to good play, they usually come plummeting right back down to earth. Ben Solak from The Ringer did a dope video on this last year where he lays out the life cycle of most backup quarterbacks. Stage one, trepidation. Stage two, optimism. Stage three, cold reality. And stage four, anonymity. It's really a dope breakdown and the pattern is pretty consistent, but let's focus on stage two, which he hilariously calls the uproarious intoxicating optimism stage. I'm familiar with this stage. I'm living there right now. How long you thought I was going to go in this video without mentioning Jake Browning? I made it past three minutes. Anyway, brief history. This preseason, Jake Browning battled with Trevor Simeon, the same dude who couldn't hold the job down with the Jets. Jake battled with him this preseason, and I felt like Simeon almost came in as the de facto backup, so Jake really had to take the spot. Most fans assumed that Trevor Simeon would be the backup, and I had my doubts, but here's what I said after the first preseason game. Cause what I seen from Trevor Simeon and Jake Browning tonight was not, I don't wanna be too hard on him, but it wasn't overly impressive. I actually thought Jake Browning looked much, much better than Trevor Simeon, even though Trevor Simeon is the veteran. You know, Trevor Simeon is the veteran of the group, but to be fair, Jake Browning has been in our system for like three years now. So he looked a little bit more comfortable. Then here's what I said after the last preseason game. The lack of consistency is scary, but Jake Browning looked good today. Like he I, he put a stamp on it as far as between him and Trevor Simeon. I was going Jake anyway, but today I thought he really put a stamp on it, man. He's led two touchdown drives this uh, preseason. Trevor Simeon has led none. He hasn't led a single touchdown drive. You feel me? I've been familiar with Jake Browning since his time in Washington. I was watching their games while scouting John Ross. Also, when the Bengals reached and drafted Drew Sample in the second round, I went to go check him out and that was Jake throwing him the ball. Now he's throwing passes to him in the NFL. It ain't Joe to Jamar, but check it out, bro. I'll take it. But Jake Browning's football story is like a lot of backup quarterbacks. Good, bad, and unfortunate situations. A roller coaster ride full of highs and lows, pouring his whole damn heart into every training camp. 
But no matter how hard he studied or how well he did, by the end of camp, he would always get that knock on his door. Hey, hey, Eric, grab your playbook and, and uh, follow me. I'll take it down, Sam. All right, let's take a break to discuss today's video sponsor, Ada Health. Did you know that there's treatments available now for COVID-19? So now if you catch it, there's something you can do to avoid getting really sick. With the colder months coming up and COVID-19 cases on the rise, especially when you gathering at your family's house for holidays, it's important to know that you or your loved ones can get treatment if it's needed. Ada Health was built by a team of doctors and scientists and has a huge user base of over 13 million. Now the team has created a specialized care journey focused on risk factors for progression to severe COVID-19. With certain times of the year making it difficult to access care, Ada's free health questionnaire is a great first step. It helps you easily identify your risk for developing severe symptoms and provides guidance on possible next steps. Like how to talk to a clinician from the comfort of your home any day of the week to assess your eligibility for COVID-19 treatment. So you can stay home and stay cozy and focus on taking care of yourself and your loved ones. It's quick, easy, and helps you get the info you need on COVID-19, all to help you stay healthy this season. Click the link below to find out if you're eligible and so you can learn more about the treatment options. Thanks to Ada Health once again for sponsoring today's video. And without further ado, it's time to jump back in. But no matter how hard he studied or how well he did, by the end of camp, he would always get that knock on his door. As a guy who was on practice squads, who was behind the scene, who was on the bench for so long, did you ever think, man, I am never gonna get my shot? I've been cut and on P squads, but you know, still having that confidence of once I do figure out what I need to get better at. Like I've, I've never had a work ethic problem or, you know, you're getting cut at the end of August and they said, hey, you know, this was basically a decision made in July. You had a great camp, but you know, you're gonna be on practice squad. And uh, the other guy didn't lose the job. And so you go through basically three off seasons of going into camp knowing that this guy needs to lose the job in order for you to get it. And then all three of them, you know, they don't lose it. And they tell you, hey, you had a great camp. You're, you're continuing to get better, very positive. And, you know, I, I, yeah, you start to have that, uh, that creep into your head a little bit. But I mean, what's, what's really the alternative? You're gonna, just go quit and not play football. Like I was still in the NFL. Like I was still right in the thick of it. And uh, and I, I just had, you kind of got to keep the faith that something's going to shake out. Something's going to happen if you just keep at it long enough. And, uh, and fortunately it did. In high school, he threw for 5,000 yards every year while completing 70% of his passes. Let me read off these stats from his senior season, bro. And I want you to tell me, have you ever seen some crazy like this 5,790 passing yards with 91 touchdowns 91 touchdowns only seven picks 91 touchdowns bro i've done a lot of these read off a bunch of crazy stats i don't think i ever read that off i can't even fathom a quarterback doing that many scores i don't think he was doing that thinking i'm gonna be on the practice squad one day he got a weird mix of offers including alabama but every other school was more like oklahoma state colorado before coach prime boise which i can see but ultimately he chose to go to washington he started all four years and had a solid career. Even got Washington to the playoff, but they got smacked around pretty bad. In that year, he was a sophomore. He threw for 43 touchdowns and only nine picks to go with 3,400 yards. But he played two more seasons that were a lot less successful. And by the end of his college career, he was really just an afterthought. The dude goes undrafted, gets picked up by the Vikings, and is mentored early on by the one and only Kirk Cousins. Say what you want about Kirk, but there's not many better at showing a rookie how to prepare week to week. Maybe Jake would have stuck there, but when you a backup QB, what's the most important time of the year? That's right, the preseason. So imagine going undrafted in 2019, and then the very next year, there is no preseason. There are some different circumstances that happen. You know, COVID obviously does not help someone like myself with no preseason. And I think in three preseasons in Minnesota, I've, I've played like a total of like three or four quarters of football. In just a year and a half with the Vikings, Jake was waived three times. Then in 2021, he got picked up by the Bengals. He's just been sitting there on the practice squad for the last two seasons, waiting for an opportunity that might've never come. 
Stage four of the QB cycle is anonymity, but it's a cycle, so it's also stage zero. Most backup quarterbacks pop up and you're like, who the hell is this dude? And if he's supposed to be so decent, why have I never heard of him before? It's because they do what Jake did. They don't just sit there on the practice squad. They actively work to improve their game. You know, I've been in the NFL for a while, right. so I'm a much different player than I was coming out of college. Can you tell me just a little bit about what you think the benefit to you was to have been on practice squads to actually be in NFL buildings? Having the balance of, you know, learning from Kirk and Joe kind of learning what they did well, mistakes they made, learning through them, while also focusing on my own development of my own skills and, and really taking my uh, scout team rep seriously, uh, keeping track of like completion percentage and stuff like that to make sure that I was getting the most out of the situation I was in. And so I think being able to stay engaged and, and actively be involved in the meetings and then doing the extra work in the weight room and, and after practice getting the throws that I need to feel like I'm continuing to improve. Hearing the work he's put in and how diligently he's attacked it, all while knowing there's a chance that he'll never get to show it, kind of makes you realize the mental fortitude that it takes to be a backup who steps in and plays well. Because the position can be brutal. Look at PJ Walker. He had to go to the XFL just to prove he belongs. Came back as a backup, started a few games, and actually parlayed that to a multi-year deal but shortly after circumstances changed and he was on the street he found a new home with the browns who also recently waived him i guess it's back to the practice squad the life of a backup but no backup quarterback has been through what tyrod taylor has unless a man would have given up a long time ago he was benched in the middle of a playoff season because the coach wanted to see nathan peterman throw picks he was stabbed in the lung by a chargers doctor which prematurely launched Justin Herbert's career. This year in New York, I think he broke several ribs, was rushed to the hospital, and was ultimately okay. But if you think backup quarterback is a walk in the park, don't tell me, bro. Go and try to tell that to Tyrod. And now that he's finally back healthy, coming off injured reserve, he'll walk in as the backup to another backup. But it's not all doom and gloom when it comes to being a backup. A lot of it can actually be pretty damn cool. It's not the same as being a starter, but there's different pros and cons. One con is the contract. That's a big one, I ain't gonna lie. But backups have a few advantages that especially star quarterbacks simply don't have when it comes to a locker room. It's like this. Everybody watching this video knows who Beyonce is. Maybe about half of y'all also know who Solange is. Beyonce's younger sister, the resemblance is unmistakable, and Solange has a fan base, but of course she's not Beyonce. While Beyonce has the pressures of record sales, and she's had to be developed under the gaze of the spotlight, Solange is in the back, man, enjoying her freedom, being creative, man, exploring, growing into a different type of art. Since you have no expectations, you're ecstatic with pretty good but for Beyonce pretty good is bad because she's expected to be great you feel me now backups get tossed into this one big category but really there's a bunch of different types of backups the old head who's been there done that and is basically a coach who's happy to get a check and mentor the young guys then there's the old head who refuses to attend training camp and patiently waits for somebody to get hurt only then will he pick up the phone because even though his skill set currently in his career says he's a backup he ain't about to do all that studying do all that traveling just for some other dude to go out there and take the snaps there's the mid-round pick who's waiting to take your spot the high draft pick also waiting to take your spot the bounce back that former high draft pick who's just floating around the league and if purdy ever slipped up he too is waiting to take your spot then there's the late pick or undrafted guy who was brought in to be a backup at best and has been trained from day one for that job then there's the tier one backup who can be a low tier starter, but as a backup can be an absolute rock star. There's also the backup who fooled the team and is getting paid like a starter. While we respect the hustle, we know he not the guy. 
Back in the day, bro, it seemed like we had more backups who offered a completely different skill set from the starter. But more and more today, we're seeing backup quarterbacks who look like the diet version of the starter they back up. And it makes a lot of sense. It allows teams to operate in a similar fashion when the starter goes down. The offense might look a little different. Maybe you lean more to one side of the playbook than the other. But when you have these type of backups, for the most part, the offense is able to continue to play in a similar way. The greatest thing about having Tyler Huntley in this particular situation sure. against these teams is that you don't have to change anything, right? Like I know people get this year in the NFL, at the time of making this video, 53 different quarterbacks have started this season. And given the fact that there's only 32 teams, it means a lot of quote unquote backups now have backups of their own. That was 10 backups or guys who didn't come into the season as starters. So basically 10 backups who started last week. According to CBS Sports, that's the most in a week that wasn't the final week of the damn season. Cause you know, in the last week, people be resting starters and stuff, but outside of that, it's the most since 2013 so if this season seems weird with all the starters getting hurt it is weird it hasn't happened quite like this in a decade let's play a game i'll name all 10 backups who started last week and whether or not they won or lost their game before we even go through it bro how do you think they did you got 10 guys did they go one and nine did they go three and seven jake browning w Minshew l zappy w trubisky l flacco W, O'Connell, L, Josh Dobbs, W, Zach Wilson, L, and clutching it out on Monday night, Will Levis and Tommy DeVito. So they went six and four, and some of them played each other, so it could have been better or worse had that not actually happened. But my takeaway is that for the most part, these dudes is holding their own. So if backups can hold their own, why aren't they starters? Well, three of the 10 at one time were actually seen as starters and have been downgraded due to age or lack of development. For some weird reason, my brain wanted to put Minshew here, but as a six round pick, he just played early due to injury. Even though he started a lot, he's still really a backup. He's like the spiritual successor of Ryan Fitzpatrick, a top tier backup who people sometimes confuse as a starter. Cause like Fitzmagic, he has something that most backups don't have. A lot of backups actually have starter talent, but they just don't have the swag, the confidence, the it factor. It's why despite his talent level, Mariota is a backup. He just doesn't have that spark that a true starter has. Bro, watch this clip of Mariota on stage with Mahomes and Kirk Cousins. And look how confidence just oozes from Kirk and Pat. Then Mariota speaks and bro, it's so uncomfortable. Patrick Mahomes, quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs. Kirk Cousins, quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. I'm Marcus Mariota, quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, we're on our summer break right now, and so the diet's a little different. And so <laughs> for me, it's less about desserts and sugar and more about just a good, hearty, cheap meal. Got a big third down to convert it, run the clock out. I think for me in my career, that was a special moment to take the team to first playoff appearance in 14 season. And you had an epic win, Harold. I was there, I was watching, I was say that. <laughs> yeah. It was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. When you throw a pass and you catch it and then score a touchdown, I think it might have been fourth down or something too, man. That was a wild moment. Having played at Arrowhead a couple of times, I know how tough it is. We played on Monday night, you know, we played there in some tough environments. And so to kind of watch him go on the road in the playoffs and do it, I was like, man, that takes some grit to do that. This dude has a lot of wins in tough places. No doubt. <laughs> guys, no doubt. Seattle, Arrowhead, man. I appreciate that. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's really not a shot at Mariota, by the way. Like, I promise, like, I'm not doing that to try to seem mean-spirited. I don't know how it comes across, but how I feel is the opposite. As an introverted person, I can really empathize. I felt like this, like, hella times at random get-togethers. So when I see it, bro, I almost get that same crazy feeling that I feel when I'm in this situation myself. Ever since I've seen the quarterback documentary, I've been leaning towards doing a deep dive on Marcus Mariota and what happened to his confidence. Was he always like this or did the league take it out of him? But when you watch quarterback, you can't help but notice the gloomy, unsure energy that he brings. And because these dudes are at the top of the competitive world, every time it switches to Marcus, you can't help but be like, damn, come on, bro, you won the Heisman. You was a top three pick. So most backups either have an obvious lack of physical tools or they got a lack of that alpha dog confidence. But these recent backups feel like they fell through the cracks due to a lack of those obvious physical tools. They maybe don't have great size, don't have the strongest arm, don't have the best 40 
time straight to the practice squad. But on the confidence side, bro, these dudes got something to them. So the dream continues. Just why hasn't this moment, these moments, why haven't they been too big? I've been playing football since I was five years old. It's a kid's game, so I just try to enjoy it. Congratulations on the win. Joshua Dobbs is a literal genius. People love him and he walks around every day with that confidence. Jake Browning with the same initials and the upside down number is so damn cool. He gives you Joe Burrow vibes. Tommy DeVito, come on man, dude is cooler than the starter. Because of that, a lot of people think these guys should get their own team. And if that's their ambition, bro, of course there's nothing wrong with that. But instead of becoming a fringe starter who's replaced in two years, being a high profile career backup, does have its benefits. Backup quarterback is the ultimate star in your role position. You can go down as a legend being primarily a backup. Charlie Batch, Doug Flutie, Nick Foles won a Super Bowl. Josh McCowan was a backup for so long he got a head coach offer out of it. Josh Johnson's career is legendary. He played for damn near every team. Chase Daniel got paid. He might be the richest backup ever. Who is one of your favorite backup quarterbacks of all time? Now, if you buy into the cycles of the backup quarterback, then both Browning and DeVito are currently stage two. Just a couple of weeks ago, Josh Dobbs was as well, but he's recently started to slip into the dreaded stage three. The cold, dark reality. Four picks a couple weeks ago and 63 yards passing this past week. The Vikings are now considering benching him when just a couple weeks ago, the fan base thought he was the guy for at least the rest of the season. In stage two, they was talking playoffs and stop me if you heard this before but they was talking about how josh dobbs might be better than their starter and bro ben solak was genius for pointing out these cycles because like he said every fan base thinks they're the first to have these thoughts so when you have a good backup and you know that portion of the fan base wants to throw away the starter they usually end up looking like idiots now for some teams it's different because they got starters that's really backup so replacing a backup with another backup who has a little more upside in that situation it might be worth the risk but if you have a special talent and a backup who's a lesser version of that you should cherish that backup as he can keep the team afloat but the whole he's better than the starter or he's almost just as good we should replace him and use that money man shut the hell up you sound dumb that's not a knock on your backup it's his job to keep the team afloat and when the starter is there is his job to support said starter if you have a special starter and you have a really good backup. Don't underestimate what the backup does and think he's only contributing if he's starting. He's great at what he does. That means he's great in preparation. He's that second set of eyes. And in a pinch, he can keep your team afloat. It's an extremely important position, getting more important every year. You see all these starters hurt, you better have you a good backup. If you plan on making consistent playoff runs and always being competitive, bro, year in and year out, it's an extremely important position. And once you move the back up to a starter, then who's backing him up? Your entire QB room would get significantly weaker. But listen, bro, if your backup is balling right now and you want to stay in stage two and skip stages three and four, remember, even though it's unlikely, it is possible because the greatest player ever was a goddamn backup.